Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Dotson, and I'm the founder and pro program coordinator for Highland Park Poetry. And welcome today to Poetry Today. I have two fabulous guests, Beatrice Badikian, Badikian Gartler and um, Joshua Corey. Um, and uh, both of these guests will be per, uh, reading, being for, featured reading for High, Highland Park Poetry at events this fall. Uh, Beatrice will be at October 10th at the Art Center of Highland Park, and Josh will be reading on uh, December 12th, both Friday evenings uh, at 8 p.m. At, at the Art Center of Highland Park at 1957 Sheridan Road. So we're really glad that both of them could join me today to talk about their books and their process and their poetry and um, but let me give you a little brief, brief background on Beatrice. Uh, born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, but, uh, but Beatrice has a PhD in English from the University of Illinois in Chicago. She's lived in the Chicago area for over 40 years. Um, so you're local now, right? <laughs> and, um, she teaches at various institutions, including Northwestern University, Loyola University, and Roosevelt University. Her essays, poems, and stories have been published in the New York Times travel section, Third Woman, Dialog Dialogo, close, maybe, yeah, not close. even, <laughs> All right. Blue Lake Review, After Hours, Make Magazine, Hammers, Journal of Modern Poetry, and many others. Her new poetry collection, Unveiling the Mind, has just been published by Pandora Lobo Estepario Press, and uh, she also has a website and a blog, and wow, so much, so much writing, so much, and teaching as well. Yes, I do. So this is the, I'm sorry, the fourth collection? This, the well, this is the uh, really second collection of poetry. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, tell me about the, this manuscript. How is it different from the first time that you published a collection? Well, um, these are poems I've been working on for probably over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, they are much more um, personal in some ways. There is uh, different uh, sections. Um, one of them is called Union Pier Poems. When um, uh, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I spent a month in Union Pier in Michigan, and I set myself a, a task of writing one poem a day. Oh, wow. And okay. so um, I did that, and then eventually uh, I revised and edited, and I, you know, I, there's about 12 poems that okay. were left from that. All right. So there is a fair amount of personal experience in these poems. Okay, so assembling, I mean, 10 years is a long time to be. When did you really start working on putting the manuscript together? Um, I was thinking of this for, for a long time. And uh, I always had the title of the collection in, in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Unveiling the Mind. And after I wrote that poem, then I thought, this is what I, I want to call the manuscript eventually. So okay. uh, I just decided to, uh, you know, put them in different sections slowly. Is that one of the poems you wanted to share with us uh, today? Or I, I can. Okay. Sure, right. I can. Did you want to go ahead? Why don't you go ahead and, and read oh, the poem? Oh, okay. That would be great. Sure. Give us a taste, a sample. Okay. Um, this, is, uh, this poem is uh, dedicated to Nawal El Sadawi, who is a, an Egyptian writer and doctor. And uh, I saw her at a conference uh, many years ago, and that's when um, the, the idea of the poem came. But um, I've read her work. She's very famous, um, very well known in Egypt and in the f in feminist circles, and it's quite an inspiration. So um, I wrote this, and then uh, written, um, you know, in a, a couple of years ago when there was all the um, Egyptian. Uh, Spring, Spring right. uh, okay. and my, these people asked me for this poem, and they posted it in different uh, oh, websites and okay. blogs. So okay. it kind of became famous, dis despite you know me you know <laughs> I didn't know about that. So unveiling the mind. 
although your brother failed in school, he was rewarded by playing outside. You, who succeeded, were rewarded by working in the kitchen. The school books said, the stars were created by God. But who created God, you asked? An explosion of white hair. Every life is important, you say. Write your life. In prison, paper and pen are more dangerous than guns. You wrote your memoirs on smuggled out toilet paper with an eyebrow pencil from a prostitute. You hid them in a tin can under the floor. The guard never found them. Riding more necessary than breathing, you ask, why do we write? An answer, not to die, to be immortal, and demand the unveiling of the mind. Hmm. Wow, well, that, it does make you want to go back and uh, learn more about the woman that yeah, inspired the poem. I That's know, very she's, impressive. she's amazing. She's, she's in her 80s, and she's still out there in the streets. And, protesting. Well, that's in, in, in contrast, I imagine, with your Union Peer poems. Yeah. So you have kind of a, a broad yeah. spectrum of, of material. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk about how, uh, about uh, with some of your influences um, on your writing. Um, well, you know, my favorite poems growing up in Argentina, I, I read a lot of Pablo Neruda in uh, Garcia Lorca, um, and uh, I kind of swallowed them whole, and I <laughs> feel like I'm regurgitating them, you know, that kind of rhythms and imagery I like to use. Um, th you know, those are two of my favorite poets mm -hmm. that I grew up with, so I always yeah. look to them. Uh, so you, it's a conscious choice to, that you, or do you, well, think, or you think it's just sort no, of I think part of you? Yeah, I think it's unconscious. Mm -hmm. But people sometimes say when they read, like, oh, you know, you re remind me of, you know, Neruda. I mean, you know, that's quite a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, okay. you know, that kind of imagery and uh, rhythms and things like that. Well, one of the interesting things that both guests are, um, you also have written a novel. Yes. And um, so my, I wonder, how did being a poet inform your process when you were writing Old Gloves, your novel, which, now this yeah. was a longer, a longer time ago. This was in 2005. Right, that, right. Yeah, yeah, well, I started working on the novel about 10 years before that. Okay. Actually, when I was in graduate school, I was working on that as sort of part of my schoolwork. Okay. And then after I finished, I just kept with it. And uh, the novel is based on the stories of my family, mm -hmm. um, my parents and grandparents, and um, starting in the beginning of the 19th, 19th century. And um, so it starts in Turkey, where my grandparents were from. Mm -hmm. And so they moved to Greece and then it moves to Argentina and then to the U.S. So it spans oh, wow. about the 20th century. And, um, you know, my idea was to just tell their stories. Um, I, I knew what I heard from my father and my mother and uh, things that they wrote down. And I just sort of added a lot of stuff by doing research, okay. created these characters uh, based on their lives. And, um, you know, they're, uh, they kind of move quickly. They're short chapters. And I think that's, as a poet, I guess I like shorter things rather <laughs> than long <laughs> things. <Right. laughs> I love, like, flash fiction. You know, I love short stuff. So the, the chapters are shorter. More compact. Two or three pages okay. each. And they see, like, four sections. And um, it comes up to the recent past, you know, about 1980s. And, you know, the, the narrator is uh, sort of me, but, you know, with a different name and different attributes. So it's not really a memoir? No, it's, it's not. It's I, I didn't want to do a memoir because mm -hmm. it gets too complicated and you never know who gets offended. And, 
<laughs> things like <laughs> right. that. So, and Keep besides, I didn't know a lot of stuff, you know, because I wasn't there. Right. So. You just had the, the, I had the skeleton right. of the stories, but right. you had to flesh them out and right. make them yeah. real. And, oh, yes, right. yes, yes, okay. yes. Well, now, are, is there, um, are there another poem from Unveiling the Mind that you can oh, share with us? Oh, sure. That would be sure. great. I'll, um, I'll do a newer one. Unveiling the Mind uh, was written quite a while ago. Um, let's see. Um, this is, uh, when I was uh, about four years old, I had polio. Oh, wow. So this is a poem called Polio. On the hospital bed, I sit, my four-year-old hands folded on my lap. I wait. We all wait alone in our pain. Four, five, eight-year-olds. My gaze glued to the door of the vast children's ward. Tall beige walls, dark gray tiled floors, windows fogged with years of dust and grime and sorrow. On the white sheets I sit, in the Hospital de Niños, frail and dark. I wait for my mother, for my father. We all wait. A nun washes my face, combs my hair, makes me pray. No breakfast for you today, she says, and moves on to the black-haired girl next to me, still asleep. But before mom and dad arrive, two barely orderlies wheel me down the hallway. Where are we going, I ask in my small, brave voice. In the OR, the nurse covers my face with a mask. W what is this? I ask again. I don't hear the answer. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't cry. <laughs> no, 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 but it's so, I mean, yeah, you can really, it's, it's just see the, being a small child in a very, very scary situation. Yes. Um, and with little and no information. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, that part of my life, you know, I remember pretty well. And in the novel, I, you know, I, I write about that with, you know, much more detail. Okay. It, it was fairly important. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. it was a, you know, was a big oh, and deal. Oh, and four years old, I mean, that's kind of like the early onset of yeah. memory memory where you really right. Have right. A, start to have a yes. consciousness and right. events sort of start to take shape. Sure, and yeah, you, that's when you, you start know. remembering. And obviously, especially when they're as profound as that one, <laughs> by being in the hospital by yourself with yeah. the nuns. And yeah, when, yeah, when hospitals had nuns. Right, oh my god. The old days. Well, it's, um, in terms of other, you, well, you mentioned, you keep mentioning these, the, the Union Peer poems. Are oh, those, want, I want a Union Peer you poem. Want a, okay, it's a little, a little, I'll read a shorter one. I, okay. don't, I won't read a longer one. Um, let's see. Okay, well, how about if I read first day? Okay. Um, I realize we do, we, we're running out of time, though. Oh. So how about just the, can you introduce it and then, for like an excerpt? Okay, I'll read yeah. the, the first yeah. stanza. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The season of snow has given way to this month of May, when wildflowers tumble out of the darkness, strutting their warm purples and deep yellows out on the prairie. After this morning's rain, the sun slices in between impossibly high red oak branches, its lukewarm rays diving all the way down into the forest floor, where the smell of the wet woods rises to meet my deep breathing. Mm. Thank you. You're Thanks welcome. Very much. <laughs> and my next guest is uh, Joshua Corey. Joshua is the author of four collections of poetry, uh, the newest of which is The Barons, which is published by Omnidon Press, and a novel this year, Beautiful Soul, an American Elegy, which is, oh, I'm going to but butcher this pronunciation, Sputen Sputen Duvel. Sputen Duvel. Actually, actually <laughs> I'm making that up. I oh, you have no idea how it's pronounced. <laughs> okay. No. Well, if we were Dutch, we would assume a Dutch accent and... Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, 
uh, but that's also come out this year. Very exciting to be doing two such very big it's a projects. Big year, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is exciting. Well, talk to us about that. Oh, and I should also mention that you live in Evanston, and you're an associate professor of English at Lake Forest College. Just up Sheridan Road. That's right. All right, not yeah. too far away. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully, some of your students will come to the event in December. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> right. That would be nice. Yeah. But you mentioned that you're you're on sabbatical now, so you won't be able to hold grades on there over the. That's right. The, no. No purely, blackmail. Purely their good. <laughs> will is okay. uh, all I can count on. That's right. Okay. That's right. <laughs> but do talk to us about, I mean, it is a banner year to have two publications. And, yeah. And no, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I think um, the, really a coincidence, uh, publishing works, you know, sort of fits and starts uh, very, very slowly and then very, very fast. Okay. So um, the uh, poetry book was coming out for a while. Uh, oh, I knew that right. was going to come out as soon as 2012, I think. Um, but my publisher had to put it in the pipeline. They bring out mm, eight books a year, maybe. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then the novel, by contrast, was only accepted last year. And then suddenly the publisher said, let's bring it out in June. And I said, OK. Ooh. So uh, <laughs> so the two book, uh, that book came out in June, uh, officially, um, though it's still very new. And okay. uh, the poetry book will be out at the end of this month, uh, in October, oh, I should say. OK. Yeah. So you had come completed the manuscript years in advance of the novel, or had you been working on them No, no, I've been working on, I, I, I was working on them simultaneously. Um, most of the manuscript of the Barons, the poetry book, was finished by the time I started working on the novel, but some of its most important poems, including the title <coughs> poem, okay. came afterward. Um, and uh, it's my tendency to keep playing with the manuscript and adding things and subtracting things up until okay. the moment the publisher actually snatches it out it's of my hands. Stop. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. yeah. Yeah. There are some changes I'd like to make now, actually. Oh, my gosh. I okay, it's a little for, late. <laughs> I have to settle for penciling them into my own copy. Okay. All right. Um, well, what about, inf I mean, did the writing of the novel, being a poet, influence the prose, or did the, hmm. what, mm -hmm. talk to us about the novel was, um, I really became uh, very interested in sentences. Uh, when you uh, write poetry, uh, verse, uh, you think in lines, mm -hmm. um, and there's a tension between the line and the sentence, which is part of what makes poetry uh, so exciting. It's the mainspring, actually, mm -hmm. I think, of poetry, is the fact that you are reading a unit that's a line that may or may not also be a sentence, mm -hmm. or might be part of a larger and more complex construction. So the reader, um, has to be constantly changing her mind and revising what she just read and questioning what uh, she just read uh, in the process of encountering the poem. And that, for me, is what's so thrilling about poetry. So um, writing in sentences was appealing partly because, um, I mean, there really is a very literal difference. You know, if you look at a poem on the page, there's all this ragged white space. Mm -hmm. If you look at a prose, it goes all the way across. Right. So I thought, I'm just going to go all the way across. And I'm going to write these long sentences and see where they take me. Um, okay. uh, but at the same time, the poetic impulse is very present in the novel. It has that subtitle, An American Elegy. Mm -hmm. And an elegy is a poem of consolation for a loss. Uh, typically okay. written um, you know, to the wake of someone's death. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this novel is uh, my somewhat peculiar attempt to uh, elegize my own mother, who passed away when I was uh, young, when I was 21, oh. um, and who is a recurring figure in my poetry and who is mm -hmm. the uh, inspiration or the goad behind a lot of what I write. Um, so in some ways, it didn't actually feel that different from mm -hmm. writing poetry. And yet, on the other hand, there are characters, there are incidents, there's history, uh, backstory. backstory. There's a big chunk of the book that takes place in Paris in May 1968 when there were these student uh, rebellions there that are very famous. So mm -hmm. I had to do a little research for that, or oh, actually okay. a lot of research for that. Um, and so it took me places that I certainly did Never you get to do to research go. in Paris? I did actually okay, go to well Paris. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I was in Paris for unrelated reasons, and okay. then I kind of actually got to go back and fact check. Um, okay. I was very fortunate in being able to do this. Um, and mm. uh, mostly just look around and see if things looked the way I thought they should look. But I am a little terrified to have an actual French person read it. <laughs> okay. About the things I might have gotten wrong. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, now, Back to your collection, The Barons. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a poem that you m could read to us? Sure. Sort of as a, as yeah. a, a sample from? 
I'll read the first okay. poem. And uh, this is a book, uh, a collection that really I wrote over the past 10 years, which have it been... It seems to be uh, a magic number. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's been a pretty disastrous 10 years. I think many people would agree. Uh, and so um, in some ways, this is a, a book that's very much in the spirit of the... Um, apocalyptic mood that seems to be in so much of our pop culture right now, the Hunger Games and so forth, and you know, zombie movies and The Walking Dead. And uh, I think the challenge of the book for me was to write from or in this apocalyptic point of view, but to uh, do the opposite of what they, uh, you know, there are all these survivalists and there are even TV shows now. Preppers. Preppers, right. Yes. People who are like trying to insulate themselves from the disaster. Uh, whereas I feel like my stance is completely the opposite. I want to be as vulnerable as possible to the disaster. So this is a poem that kind of kicks that off. It's called The Millions. Epic fail in the man I sing above the strip in the heat index, dead, desiring, dry tsunami, curtaining the buildings like fallout, drifting through corridors, tidal, sweeping sunglasses, crankshafts, eye beams before it. Still itself the wreckage amidst the wreckage. Meanwhile, staggering on, the zombie economy tries to think itself out of its mind, like a small, vicious, strong-smelling animal, say, a mink, caught in the iron cage of its natural habitat. We shamble until we stop or are stopped. Under the interchanges, Abandoned cars strung out like beads. Doors flapped open like tongues. Shading eyes to the horizon. The catastrophe squatting there with its million tongues. As if it were that simple to bear it, to witness the event. If I could get it in gear, I would, believe me. Can't find the wound with my hands, but it's an arrow piercing me and everyone. Branching back in ragged feathers, its purer linearity thrust forward between my daughter's eyes. Back turned to web simultaneity. This morning, thousands died. The evening's birth is universal. No, I can't count that high on my fingers and toes. Even visual modeling makes a window, but I don't know the code. Zeros and ones fly by, adding up to the verb intelligence. As for living, our hybrid vehicles will do that for us. Mm. The window's closing and all that air and light to render it spectacular and unusable. But for now, nothing protects me. And I'm glad to be the child of my face and time. <laughs> child of my place and time, that's interesting. To be the child of my place and time, the father too, I would make a model, means of seeing, diorama, glued to a plank in reason, floating in whatever gutters are left under a few stars to document my failure, to secure and see the millions. Find me midstream dragging a hand behind, grasping fishy Heraclitus, pushing me back and under, drowning my life and my life together for a breath, counting cadence to survive the work of open eyes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, it's a, the very dark and bleak um, yes. prediction. <laughs> we hope it's not it's a prediction. Not it's what I oh, see outside my window. Oh, well, okay. Honestly, yes. You know? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's true. All right. The, the, and the, especially the under change, over changes. What do you call them? The interchanges. Interchanges. Yeah. Well, Sorry that, okay, about that. That's Inter clearly, over. That's okay. from TVs and movies. But, right. Uh, yeah, I wrote that poem in Las Vegas, and it was the end of a drought of oh. poetry. I had not been writing okay. poems for a long time. And it's very easy, it's especially easy, I think, in Las Vegas to sort of imagine it uh, depopulated mm -hmm. uh, okay. because it is in the desert, and it so sh clearly should not be there and should <laughs> okay. not work. And it, right. at the same time, I think Las Vegas is kind of glorious. I kind of, you know, I, I love okay. its artificiality. It, it really seems uh, to participate in some of the same mad intensity as uh, sending a rocket to the moon or something like that. So I, I love it and I hate it. Um, okay. So many things. Well, but they say that that dry heat is That's much right. more tolerable than the, uh, I, I, than I the moist uh, I summers that we have here in Illinois. I do prefer a dry heat, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, well, I was 
what else was I going to ask you? Well, yeah, I noticed when I was looking at your manuscript that a lot of your poems are visually mm -hmm. shaped, or may not all of them, but certainly some of them. Yeah. And so that does pose a challenge that, that really, in a reading situation, which we're both, you're both going to be doing, you can't. The audience doesn't get the benefit of that visual sense. Yeah. Um, so do you just not read those poems, or do you? No, I mean it depends. Uh, some poems use white space, a lot of white space on the page, and I think of the white space as being like silence. So okay. I can actually, when I read, perform the silence. Uh, there are other poems which are really much more for the eye than for the voice, and I mm -hmm. would. Uh, um, there's one poem in particular in this book called Material Witness, which I think I would either need to read three times or I would need two assistants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, I think I would like that best. I would need two assistants okay. and we would all read the same poem simultaneously. Mm. And okay. you probably would be able Because there's those many ways to read it. Yeah, there's a okay. poem is in two columns. You can read each column separately and you can also read them across. Okay. So, but I think that would kind of be a neat way to create sort of a verbal environment for the right. listener. It'd be sort of a John Cage kind of thing. You wouldn't necessarily understand it, but you, you'd feel something. You'd know it was a happening. That's right. It would be an event. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Well, I know that a, a Highland Park Poetry is very excited to have you both be the featured guests at our events um, this fall. It does add a, a lot of spice to our, our lineup of uh, guest poets. And um, did you have a, one more poem to read for us? Oh, Would sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, this is a poem, um, the title of this, I, I, I heard it, I think I heard it, I feel like I heard it in the radio, but it seems like such a strange thing to have heard, and yet I do believe this was a phrase, it's called Cognitive Deficit Market, um, and I believe it was probably Marketplace or something, and they were talking about with the increase of diagnoses of Alzheimer's, this book sounds so cheerful, doesn't it? It does. Um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that there was... Uh, a growing cognitive deficit market, a market for drugs okay. and treatments for people, people who are, are having cognitive okay. deficits, who All are right. losing their minds, basically. Uh, so here's a poem about that. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's, it's, it's got some narrative elements to it. Um, but I, I hope people can hear that there's some playfulness um, as well as uh, sort of doom and drama uh, in this writing. Cognitive deficit market. She has forgotten what she forgot this morning. Her keys, toast in the toaster, blackening, the insides of beloved skulls, little planetariums, projecting increasingly incomplete and fanciful constellations, the gravid ass, the mesozoic cartwheel, the big goatee, the littlest fascist. Outside her window, a crowd gathers, seething in white confusion, like milk boiling dry in a saucepan. Some lift fingers to point this way and that with herky-jerky certainty, but they're standing too close for all those flying hands so that eyeglasses and hats fall. Apologies inaudible, someone hands a fist. The brawl overwhelms the meager traffic of pedicabs and delivery trucks stacked high with rotting lettuce. Meanwhile, above it all, she's setting out the tea things, ceramic cup and saucer, little pewter spoon, pebbled iron pot, a slice of Sara Lee, waiting to remember to turn the radio on, listen for the elevator, for the lock to turn or a knock on the door. In a little while, she'll put everything away in the same configuration at the bottom of a clean white sink with its faucet dripping. We who watch this, half turned away already toward sunny gardens or the oncoming semi, being not the one dead, but not exactly alive either, the skin is a glove that wrinkles as it tightens. The cerebellum's the same. A game of chess between walking sticks. I mean the insects made up to resemble wood. I say we dissemble from photographs to repeat our stakes in weightless names. Well, thank you very much. That was great. That's going to be the end of our program today, but thank you so much for Thank coming. you for having us. Yeah, Thanks for having us. Great. I think we're...